Being a park ranger means being prepared for literally anything. We often wear many hats and act as communication between lots of different service providers and even authorities. We can be search and rescue, doctors, ER doctors, police, teachers, and sometimes even parents. We always have our wits about us, or at least try to, and you get used to certain sights, sounds, and smells, depending on which branch of ranger you are. The search and rescue obviously deal with more grisly situations. Now, before I started this, roadkill would make me have especially the smell on a hot summer's day. Whilst I by no means enjoy it, I am just kind of used to it. I've seen hikers that have taken a fall, shins sticking up to their legs. I've seen arms and ankles bent the wrong way. Even a car crash that happened near us that we were called in for extra assistance since there were parts all over the highway. That was bad, but at least there was a reasonable account for why I handed a CSI a part of the human body I was not able to identify. What I found one day on a seemingly routine check way deep into the park where barely anybody goes could not so easily be explained. One of the things I really enjoy most about the job is the freedom. Yes, we all have a role to play, but unless there is something specific going on, we can travel to any part of the vast parkland that was like and work in that area. I had chosen a remote location because of the very fact it seldom gets visited, and therefore, sometimes we are lucky enough to discover young over there and varying different species I wanted to see if there was anything new to log, especially any of our lesser populated animals. There isn't much of a proper trail out there. We do maintain some sort of pathway for the most part. It is kept for nature and overgrown. It's too far out for any adventurous school of scouting groups, and the majority of hikers head in the opposite direction. This was springtime and early morning, still fairly warm, and all of a sudden, the smell hit me. It wasn't super strong, but enough that I knew exactly what it was. Blood. Of course, I wasn't alarmed. We do have an occasional bear here and there, and other animals who stalk and eat each other. After all, this is the wild. However, what I was in no way expecting to find was a human hand nailed to a tree trunk. It had been hacked off the wrist. I say that because this was not a clean surgical cut. The edge of the skin was raggedy, bits of tissue dangling off. The blood I could smell had pooled at the bottom of the tree, staining the ground this darkish brown color. The blood had coagulated and had been there at least a few days. There was a lot of flat activity, but nothing else had been along to nibble at it, so it seemed. Possibly because it was nailed about eight feet off the ground. I, of course, called it in, and my boss called the police. We helped them do a full sweep of the area, but did not find any other body parts. They told us after doing a full investigation... Nobody had been to any of the local hospitals with a missing hand. The prints and blood did not match anything on record. All they could tell was that it was a middle-aged white man. We'll never know how it got there. Why there was no other evidence like blood anywhere else or footprints, tire tracks, and just how on earth it got nailed up that far onto the tree. We also now routinely check that area, just in case keeping the pathways a little clearer. Nothing else has happened since, though. Thank God. I was helping to supervise a middle school overnight camping trip when something extremely terrifying happened. I'm a ranger, and oftentimes I help out with any educational or scouting groups. Kids can be great fun, 
and I have a lot of fun with them. Coming from a big family myself, I have a lot of experience with siblings and even younger cousins. Sometimes on these trips, one of the kids gets scared. Even as middle schoolers, the woods are dark and can sometimes make strange noises and add into the spooky campfire tales we like to lightly scare them with. It's no wonder that one or two of them end up with nightmares. And sometimes, especially if they are already spooked, their eyes can play tricks on them. One little kid was obviously upset and trying not to show it after listening to the famous dog licking your hand under the bed story. A short while, with everybody set up in their tents, there was a tap on mine, asking if I'd walk him over to the bathrooms. There is a creek behind them, which you know is pretty convenient. And all of a sudden, I heard a scream, and he came running back, saying he'd seen a figure. I had told him to run back to the tents as I had a good look around. I couldn't see anybody, but a few moments later, I was joined by one of the teachers. When the kid had gotten back to the tents, he'd been so upset that he'd tumbled straight into the faculty tent, told them that somebody was trying to murder him. I told the poor member of staff that that wasn't quite correct, what the kid had told me, that he'd seen a figure and that I'd made a sweep of the area. I couldn't find any trace of anybody being there, other than us. Still, just to be on the safe side, we reported it back to base. We always have extra staff on and somebody remains in the office when we have kids on site. And my calling Joe was on all night long. He promised to make some routine checks. He let us know immediately if he saw nor came across anything that might put the campers in danger. It was very much protocol, but we didn't think for a moment anything would actually happen. Even though I was 99.9% .9 sure the kid had just imagined it due to spooky stories and the fact that it was so dark, it had still unnerved me. Maybe some of his fear had rubbed off. Now, I wasn't scared, but I did feel a sense of trepidation. Since I couldn't sleep, I sat on a lawn chair outside of my tent, keeping on my flash and being very glad of my Kindle. I stayed awake pretty much all night, waving at Joe every now and again as he passed by, being extremely grateful when he brought me another cup of coffee around 3 a.m. About 6 a.m.-ish, the kids began to wake up, and sure enough, soon there was a line needing to use the bathroom. I had not taken the kids this time, but suddenly, there was another scream, and so naturally I rushed over. This time, a little girl was flooding with tears, claiming she had seen a body in the water. I got the teachers to take all the children back to the site and pack up immediately. I radioed Joe. Then, I stepped around the back of the restroom block, over to the creek. Now that it was light out, I could see far better, and I could even make out that, yes, there was indeed a figure or a body in there. Quickly, I took a photo on my cell, radioed to Joe to cancel any 911 calls. The children and teachers were hysterical when I arrived back at camp. I called for all of them to hush so I could explain what happened, but that we were ultimately safe. I then pulled out my cell, showed the faculty member in charge the photo i just taken. She looked at the boy from last night and the little girl who was still in tears and burst out laughing. Come here, kids, she said, in that kind of firm but kind way only teachers seem to possess. They went over to her, and she showed them the photo, zooming in on the body. At first, they looked scared, then confused, and then finally relieved. I'm sure they'll see the funny side one day when they are older and less traumatized. Otherwise, they'll have to always be mindful when visiting. You see, floating in the creek was a large garden gnome, 
I definitely imagine it looked terrifying to the kid in the dark, even to the little girl in the morning, who had no doubt heard the rumors about a mysterious figure. We have no idea how this gnome ended up in the creek. The park isn't exactly a hot spot for fly tipping, and the nearest home is miles away. We kept him in the office afterwards, calling him Richie, after the kid who thought he was an axe murderer. Sorry this story isn't scary, but more funny than anything else. I work as a ranger out in Pennsylvania, and we have a very large cave system. We have to monitor this. Although the area is checked on fairly regularly, there are parts that are so remote, they probably have never ever been recorded. Like, unless we are actively doing a search and rescue, we don't head out there. So, when we report that something or cavers had been exploring and come across a crime scene, we aren't that surprised at all. Since they said there wasn't any bodies or injured parties, we headed over to check it out before filing our own report to the sheriff. What we found was really weird. The first off, my buddy swore that he'd been in this particular cave before. But some of the items we found were years old. And I mean decades. There were old cans in there with expiry dates back from the 1970s. The crime scene the explorers had alluded to was actually a bloody shirt hanging on the wall of the cave. Again, it looked really old. Maybe not as old as the food cans, but certainly nothing recent. Further inspection came up with three more things. A human femur, clean with no marking, suggesting injuries. A well-read paperback book, a copy of The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, published in 2003, and a word that had been scratched somehow onto the cave wall, probably with a knife or a jagged rock. It simply spelled out help. Of course, we called the police. They ran some tests, did some digging, but ultimately, it all led to a dead end. Pretty creepy, though. Especially the vast amount of time difference between the items. Old food cans from the 70s, and a book from a little over 15 years ago. Who needed help? And if they died in that cave, why was just a femur left? Where was the rest of them? I'm about 49 now, about to be 50, and I'm no longer in the forest service industry anymore, but I have some tales that will scare the hell out of you. I don't have time to sit down and write them all out, but there is one that comes to mind that I will share with you, since you seem to be obsessed with deep woods, park rangers, and strange things. The year was 1995. I'll never forget it. Mainly because I went through a lot of stuff that year. A divorce, both my parents passing, among some other personal tragedies and hardships I was forced to endure. But beside that, that was also the year... I experienced some strange things while in the job. But more importantly, a good colleague of mine, who we became very close friends while we worked together alongside as rangers. While him and I both have our fair share of strange, creepy experiences, there's one that really sticks out that happened in June of 1995. I'll never forget it. I was out doing my rounds and I got a call over the radio. He told me that he was pretty sure he was being followed, and that he was being terrified, stalked by some large men. Of course, I radioed back, asking him what he meant. A little side note. My colleague, we'll call him David, since I won't be revealing his real name, was out in a section of the park that is much more secluded. In fact, there's no trails over there. There are no hikers. There's no camping. No reason for anybody to be back there. But I guess there had been some issues back there that our supervisor wanted him to go check out. After going there and seeing that there was no issues at all, which the original issue was, I believe my supervisor was under the impression there was a small camp out, or possibly a homeless camp. I'm not exactly sure, 
my memory doesn't serve me all that well on that detail. Anyway, after arriving back, which, by the way, this was also in the evening, he radios over to me, saying that he is completely terrified, that these large men are chasing him. I tell him he's okay, and to just make it back as quick as he can. We agree to meet back at the station. Probably about 45 minutes later, I'm already there, waiting for my shift to get over, and he pops in, and I've never seen him so white in my life. Now, my colleague is a white boy, but he was very, very white. I'm talking, there's no other color in his skin other than pale, and the look on his face is completely terrified. Funny, I didn't think Irishman, because he is Irish, could get any more pale than that. Already being fair-skinned, he was so terrified, he just came and sat down, and we started talking. I asked him, what happened out there? He explained to me that, you're never going to believe this, but these giant wild hairy men chased me, nearly grabbing me. It's like they let me go. Had I not gone fast enough, they would have gotten to me. When I questioned him, saying, what do you mean wild hairy men? There's none of that out there. Do you mean, did you maybe see a bear? Are there monkeys or something? He just shook his head and looked at me. He said no. These beings that chased after him were around 8 to 9 feet tall, incredibly massive, covered in long hair, with faces that were very human. He said they looked like primitive humans, kind of like cavemen or Neanderthals, but giant, and they had black eyes. He was completely terrified. He said there was about four or five of them, and they flanked him, nearly overturning his vehicle. They chased him out of there and almost wonders if maybe that was where their village was or their territory. I didn't mean to laugh at him, but I kind of just smirked, thinking, great, now we have a village of wild hairy men living in the park. My supervisor will love hearing this. Of course, I didn't fully believe him at the time, and I just figured maybe he had some sort of life situation happen that caused him to see things that weren't there. So... I gave him a pat on the back, a hug, let him know I'm here for him if he wants to talk. Later on, the next day, my supervisor was told about what happened and pulled me into the office. He sat me down and explained, did you hear what had happened with David? I explained to him, yes, I had. He looked at me with the most stern and serious look I've ever seen on my supervisor's face, which, by the way, is a pretty jovial, happy guy always cracking jokes, a prankster, if you will. This man has not been serious a day on the job in his life, so to see him like this, something was wrong. He leans over the table, maybe eight inches away from my face, and says, whatever David told you is not to leave this building or this park. Do you understand me? I will never forget those words. He was so intent on his meaning not understanding and not being willing to question my boss's motives. I just nodded my head yes, and he says, okay, good. Now, get on your duty. Leave my office. Was something to those lines. I got up, pushed in my chair, and walked out. Very strange, right? Well, that's part one. So, in the coming years, obviously that encounter or experience was kind of forgotten about by me since David and my boss didn't really bring it up again. Well, over the next four years, from 95 to 99, there was expansion on the park, particularly trails and camping, that of course branched further out of that area. Now, where David was, was probably about 4.7 miles away from the station, over in that direction, northeast to be specific. With trails and camping areas expanding, from 95 to 99, we had more encounters, I should say, or at least complaints from fellow hikers and campers. At around 98 is when a lot of the development was fully finished. Even going into the spring of 99, where new trails were established and more camping spots were created. Probably within a mile or two 
northeast in the same direction. This is when we began getting more and more complaints. People seeing strange men out in the woods. Figures. Horrible screams at night. This is when I began to put the pieces together and realized maybe David wasn't so crazy after all. My boss would not even speak on the issue. And as he told me before, whatever I learn, hear, see, or say is to be kept hush and not be spoken to outside of anybody within this park. I understood that enough that if I were to break that code of conduct, my career would be on the line. And I wasn't risking that, at least not at the time. But for me, I dealt with a lot of campers and hikers who had all sorts of stories from 98 to 99, right when this new development was pretty much being fully finalized. People were giddy to explore new areas and walk new trails. There was one loop in particular. I can't remember the name, but it did this big five-mile loop, and of course, it cut right through that northeast section, the same area in which David drove through. That's the same area in which people had complaints, seeing strange figures, hearing terrible noises, feeling like they were unsafe or being watched. Of course, me and David were called to investigate it almost every time. While I never saw or experienced anything myself, at least not until 2002, which I'll get to in another email, David had more encounters. And it eventually got so bad that by fall, November-ish, around 1999, we had to shut down the area entirely. Not the park, just this specific trail loop in parts of camping spots in this area. As I reflect and look back on all this, I almost wonder, did we come across Bigfoot territory? Maybe we encroached on their area. I don't know. At the time, I knew nothing of Bigfoot. Had I did, I don't even think that would have been something I believed in. Because it wasn't until I saw one in 2002 myself, working as a ranger in a separate park, that I became a full-on believer and started really researching, deep diving into not just cryptozoology, but Bigfoots in general. I apologize in advance if this story is kind of short-lived and I don't feel like there's a whole lot more I can add, which I'll continue in part two. But either way, some scary stuff happened in that park. A few years ago, I experienced something that was terrifying. I'm actually lucky to still be around to tell the tale. I have a Great Dane, who, of course, we had to call Scooby. And just like her namesake, she's crazy. Adorable and a very good family pet. But unlike her lazy laid-back cartoon version, our Scooby has boundless energy and needs a lot of exercise. Luckily for her, I like to jog, so oftentimes, after dropping the kiddos off at school, Scoob and I would head off to one of the running trails in the woods. I felt it good to burn off some energy, absorb some much-needed vitamin D, and, of course, burn those calories. One day, we were heading to our usual route, and we saw that the trail had been blocked off. Apparently, there had been a fallen tree and some damage to the surrounding area, this was due to a storm the night before. The worker was putting up a sign to tell joggers to avoid the path, suggesting an alternative route not too far away. It did lead further into the trees, he said, but wound up in the far parking lot at the other end of the wooded area. I hadn't been that way for years, since it is quite a bit longer, but since we didn't really have a choice and Scooby was always bouncing up and down, I decided to give it a try. Now, I may be a lone female, but I am sensible. I know, and plan my routes. I text my husband when I leave the house. When I return, I don't wear earbuds. This way, I can always be prepared for what's going on around me. I never run at night, and most importantly, I have a giant security guard with me at all times. Scooby may be a softy when it comes to her family, but she is also very protective. 
And that doesn't mean she didn't slobber all over strangers, of course. It just meant that she somehow sensed we were always safe. Being on a new trail, of course, meant a lot of excitement. Stopping to sniff and go potty every few minutes. There was just so many new things to smell and leave her scent on. Her tail was wagging constantly. She kept making happy little yaps every now and again. I was smiling. All was well. And I watched her bound over to some bushes. Scare a poor woodchuck. She never hurts them. I honestly think she just doesn't know how big she is and wants to play. I was still chuckling at the look on the woodchuck's face when all of a sudden she stops in the middle of the trail and went stiff. Again, like a cartoon dog. When Pluto acts like a pointer for Mickey, she was standing still, just staring at something up ahead. The hackles rose on the back of her neck, and I heard a noise I don't hear very often. A low and angry growl. She did not seem frightened, more alert and on edge. Ready to attack, which is highly unusual behavior. She got down low, and I could see her teeth were bared as she continued to growl. I didn't want to frighten her by calling out, and to be honest, she was making me nervous. Not because I thought that she might do something to me, but because I trusted her instinct. If she was unhappy, then something was wrong. I just had no clue as to what it might be. She suddenly leapt full pelt into the bushes in front of her, and I heard a shout. At first, I was concerned she'd hurt somebody, although my thought process quickly turned to what on earth somebody was doing behind those bushes. I could hear her growling and barking, and there was some rustling, so I called to her sharply to get back to me. As I said, she's a very good dog, so when she didn't come on my first command, I was surprised, rose my voice. Scooby, here. This time, she did as she was told. I heard another yell from whoever was in the bush as Scooby came running back over to me. I could just make out a hooded figure running away. It was all in the shadows of trees and on the other side of the bushes. It was really blurry, just like the silhouette of a person that I could see. I didn't bother calling out to them to check if they were okay, as they seemed to be wanting to get away real quick and were still shaken from Scooby's reaction. I looked down at her, and she had this sort of sorry mom look in her face and eyes. She was also holding a torn piece of green fabric in her mouth. I took it from her. It looked like it was sweater material. I guess she must have ripped it from this person's hoodie. Now, instead of heading the same way as the bush hider, we turned back and made our way back to the start. The worker was gone now. Just the sign blocking the usual trail remained. We headed home, and I called my husband to tell him we were back and what had happened. He surprised me by saying that he was coming straight home, and that I should call the police. When I asked why, he asked if I had read the news this morning. I had not. I'd planned on grabbing a coffee and sitting on the porch after reading it, after the jog. He told me to quickly look at it, whilst he drove home, then called the detective mentioned on the front of the page. I grabbed the paper and gasped as I read the story. Local police were looking for a young man who had raped and killed at least three different women. There had only been one witness so far, as the killer tended to hide in quiet and secluded wooded areas, preying on lone women. He hadn't realized one of his victims had been waiting for their teenage son to catch up. He'd caught a very quick glimpse of his mom's attacker before he'd taken a knock to the head and passed out. All he could remember was that the killer was young, male, and apparently wearing a green hoodie. Also said to be seen within this radius... There are all sorts of things that you can find in the woods. They have often been the setting for dark tales and believable ghost stories. 
depending on your point of view. The deeper you get into the forest could be magical, if you believe in fairies, educational, if you enjoy nature and learning about foliage, or downright terrifying, if you believe in monsters. This story that I'm about to share with you happened to me within the last year, and it's safe to say I will never be the same again. Since we were in the middle of COVID restrictions, I had to appease my wanderlust and travel bug by staying local. It actually gave me a much needed push to discover some of the huge parks and forests that surround me in my own part of SoCal. There was enough to keep me going for years on my own doorstep. One of the best things about hiking, that it's totally socially distanced. On the day in question, I had already decided that I was going to head as far into the woods as possible. I'd even brought some meager supplies along, including a pop-up tent, just so I can camp out, not having to be tied to the timings of daylight. The few hikers I had seen on recent trips were totally okay with a curt nod, no idle chit-chat, and staying apart in masks. I was fine with that. In fact, I hadn't seen another person for the entire day on this whole trek. Not even a ranger. I was more than happy with that. Looking back, there was very little animal activity, but at the time, I didn't really notice. As the sun began to lower and a cool breeze descended, along with a super loud growl from my belly, alerting me to the fact it was way past dinner, I decided to stop and set up camp for the night being. I was just getting myself sorted, clearing the area for a small fire, when I heard the voice. Now, of course, I don't own those woods. I didn't have the sole right to be there, but not having seen or heard anything at all for the entirety, and now suddenly, a voice appearing out of nowhere was a little unnerving. I hadn't been able to make out exactly what the person had said. It was kind of muffled, but I called back a cordial hello in response, since that seemed to be the thing to do. Again, just a muffled grunting sound, and I began to wonder if it was actually an animal instead. If you don't know, you'd be surprised just how human certain sounds from certain creatures can be. Like a deer, expelling breath can sound exactly like a human cough or a sneeze. Then there was also a terrible smell. Even now, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was, or even what it reminded me of. The closest thing I would say would be old eggs or a blocked sink drain. That almost sulfurous odor, which is utterly repellent. There was some rustling. I expected some survivor type to come racing out of the bushes, filthy, stinking, muttering garbage due to starvation, or just something, but nobody came out. Are you okay in there? I felt compelled to ask, not really wanting to hear no as a reply. But I didn't get any kind of answer, and there was no more noise. The smell, however, remained, partially covered by the smoke from the small fire that I made. If I hadn't been so tired, and it wasn't so incredibly dark, I might have moved camp, but unbelievably, despite feeling a little on edge, I fell deep asleep pretty quickly. And man, it must have been literally the deepest sleep I have ever been in, as when I woke up around 5 a.m., all hell had broke loose. My tent, only being small and not intended to be highly durable anyway, had been ripped to pieces. The shredded material flapping in the morning breeze. The few belongings I had in my backpack had been emptied out and scattered. The tin of chili I was intending to have for breakfast smashed open and eaten. The small fire was out, and by the smell of it, it had been doused with urine. Something had peed on it to put it out, and it was strong. The ammonia actually stung my eyes. It looked for all intents and purposes like an animal attack, although I was completely uninjured, thank God. 
The strangest thing of all, though, were the two sets of footprints in the dirt surrounding the carnage. Well, there were three, actually. I recognized my own set of hiking boots. The other two were harder to explain. One set definitely appeared human, although barefoot rather than a shoe print, and the other, well, the thing it most resembled was a goat, I guess, that cloven hoof. Was I attacked by a barefooted man with a pet goat, who just so happened to have sharp enough fingernails to rip through my tent, sharp enough teeth to pierce a tin can, and strong enough urine to make my eyes sting? I grabbed the few salvageable items and hot-footed it out of there as fast as I could. The whole experience was scary, but despite that most of all, I'm thankful that, for whatever reason, whatever that was did not attack me, and that somehow, despite the activity, I remained peacefully unaware in my sleep. Something happened to me a few years ago that I have never been able to share, but I will never be able to forget. I still dream about it every single night, and it has changed my life for the worst. I lost my job, my girlfriend, and definitely my sanity now. I had this great dog, but she was huge, part husky, and she required a lot of walking, which is fine as it got us both out in the fresh air. And, to be honest, I had never been more fit. On this particular day, I had been stuck at work in an endless cycle of meetings and was over two hours late home. The poor thing was beside herself, so I grabbed the leash and out we went. Maybe it was the guilt from being home late. Maybe I just needed to blow off steam from the stress of back-to-back -back meetings. But we ended up walking away further than usual into the woods behind my house. And before I knew it, it got really, really dark. Now, I wasn't at all bothered by the dark back then. Now, when I sleep, which isn't often, I have all the lights on. But then it was fine. Since Cassie was still enjoying having a good run and going on about sniffing every tree she could find, I thought I'd give her more minutes before we headed back home. I dug out my cell out of my pocket just to check the time and see if my girlfriend had text. I was surprised to see that I had no coverage at all, despite not being that far from the house, which there, I have five bars no problem. We walk in these woods all the time, and I have never had less than three bars at any given location or time. Huh. Very weird, I thought. But still, I wasn't too terribly bothered. I called out my dog. It was beginning to get chilly, and I was suddenly feeling very tired. The adrenaline from the meetings must have worn off and I just wanted to go home and collapse into bed. I kept calling her, saying, Come here, girl. Nothing. I yelled out her name again. This wasn't good. People often brag about their kids and pets, but honest to God, she was and is a very good dog and always came back when I called. That's when I heard a whimper and so I raced over in the direction, putting the flashlight on my cell phone. I kept calling her name more and more. I was starting to panic now. What was making my dog refuse to come back when I called? And why was she now whimpering? I called her name yet again, and again, rushing into the trees, and then I saw it. Now, I'm not an idiot. Back then, I wasn't a heavy drinker. I was 100% stone cold sober at this point in time. 
and I can recall and tell you every single detail as if this just happened yesterday. Cassie, my dog, was floating around about five feet in the air. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. This dog was floating in what I can only describe as an orb or bubble. It was brightly lit. She looked as would be expected, completely terrified and unaware of what was going on, but appeared to be frozen or paralyzed inside this unknown trap. However horrendous it was to see your beloved pet floating in air, what was causing this in the first place? Whatever it was, was 100 times worse. Standing not even 10 feet away from me was a gray man. A very tall, extremely skinny, completely naked gray man. No hair and a disproportionately large head with two huge, bulging black eyes. My dog had somehow been put in this floating bubble by what I can only assume was some sort of alien. It must have been seven feet tall at least, with very long, lanky arms and legs. I say he, because I presumed it was male. But to be honest, it had no genitalia or any sort of features that would differentiate it from being a male or female. I was terrified. I honestly didn't know what I should do. So I stood there, just staring at this thing, praying I wasn't going to join my dog in one of those bubbles. I'd never really been much of a believer before in paranormal, aliens, UFOs, all of that stuff. But I've seen enough TV shows to know what can happen with a probe. And once they get you in their flying saucer, you're done for. I was frozen in fear, but this creature didn't try to come any closer to me. It almost seemed to be controlling the bubble with its eyes somehow. Then, just like in the movies, there was a large beam of light from the sky, so incredibly bright that I had to shield my eyes as they felt like they might burst. Just in the split second before it went dark again, it happened. Because when I opened my eyes, they were gone. The thing, and my dog Cassie. Of course I called her and searched and wouldn't let myself believe she had just been taken. I didn't sleep a wink after I eventually got home and then returned at first light to search again. For the following two weeks, I went back there still hoping to find her or any clue as to what happened. But there was nothing. I can't move in case they bring her back, but I am always afraid now. I can only sleep once I've had enough whiskey to knock me out. I know what I saw, and it will haunt me forever and ever. Will he come back? Will he bring more? And next time, will they take a person like me? Oh, and you might as well forget about me calling the police. I don't think they're really going to be much help in this scenario. If you watch a horror movie, especially about some sort of creature feature, the action always happens in the dark, right? So you can be pretty much sure that if it's daylight, then nothing bad can happen. At least in a supernatural sense, right? Well. That's when I falsely told myself, to the point I actually believed it. Let me tell you about an experience that I had just a few years ago, back in 2016. I was big into running at the time and was always trying to find new and interesting routes, especially through thickly wooded areas. I always ran with my headphones in, catching up on podcasts, audiobooks, the likes not really paying too much attention on my surroundings. When you're in the woods, I feel like your entire inner being is a total peace. And since you're running on dirt and not hard cement, it's much easier on your knees. That being said, I never ran anywhere that would be dangerous, like by a ravine 
or even on a highway, but I was often absorbed in what I was listening to, rather than paying attention to what was going on around me. I won't ever make that mistake again. If, and it's a big if, I am ever brave enough to go running through a wooded area again, I sure as hell will have all my wits about me. You see, as I said, this happened to me in broad daylight. I was about four or five miles from my house, and I decided to take a detour through the woods. I just want to make something very clear. I don't always run through the woods because of the uneven ground, low branches, but it wasn't like I had ever been in there before. And I'm talking about this specific area of forest, which isn't really meant for running in, unlike other thickly wooded areas. I remember distinctly that I had just got to a pivotal chapter in the audiobook I was listening to, and I wasn't concentrating 100% on where exactly I was going. So, needless to say, I lost my footing. I stumbled a little, but thankfully, it wasn't anything major, and I mainly just spooked myself into thinking that I might trip. It would be a hell of a long trek back on a busted ankle. I couldn't have that, nor could I risk it. But yet here I was, being so sucked into my audiobook that I was becoming careless. I stood and caught my breath for just a moment when I caught a glimpse of movement through the trees. Not being remotely superstitious or believing at the time in any sort of BS about monsters and whatnot, my main concern was that it might be a mama forest animal who was possibly and potentially pissed at me for disturbing her and her babies. I was getting ready to haul out of there until I saw it. There was indeed a forest animal, but I have no idea if it was a mama. The deer was on the ground in the midst of being eaten by what I can make out to be a large wolf. I don't know the last time somebody saw a wolf in this part of America, but I'm pretty sure it was well before the area ever became populated with people, with houses and suburban areas as far as I was aware. There had never been any sightings or reported attacks by anything like this. So, why did I think it was a wolf? Well, as it was crouched over the deer, I can make out its pointy ears and gray furry body and what appeared to be a tail. The only thing I hadn't quite noticed at this point was A, just how big it was, and B, that it wasn't just a wolf. You see, when it had finished ripping out the deer's innards, this thing stood up on two legs. Two freaking legs like a person. And that was when I truly saw for the first time just how big it was, and how horribly human looking it was. And then, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, for some reason, I was looking at a werewolf. Whether its hunger had been satiated, or maybe it wasn't as strong and fast as you see in the movies during the daytime, I don't know. But I ran out of there as fast as my two legs would allow me to. My lungs and chest were burning until I made it out of the woods and back onto the main road. Even then, I only paused for a matter of seconds to look behind me, just to make sure it wasn't there, and continued at my pace all the way back home. Once I finally made it back inside, I tightly locked every window and door, and I swear, I couldn't even look out the window for several hours. I barely slept a wink that night. I honestly didn't know what to do if it could somehow use its superpowers to track me down. I know that's silly, but hell, I had no idea what I was dealing with. Nobody ever told me these things exist, let alone have powers to do whatever it is they do. Was I dealing with a natural animal, or was this truly a supernatural creature? I'd even seen it during the daytime without a supposed full moon, 
So, all bets were off. I was dealing in uncharted territory. In the end, I called the wildlife department and reported that I'd seen a large canine. They called back just a few hours later to say they had made a patrol in the area and despite indeed finding the carcasses of several deer heavily mutilated and partially eaten, found no trace of the predator that I was speaking of and no tracks even. As far as I am aware, there were no more sightings, at least from people that reported it. I do wonder though, how many more people like me are out there knowing what we saw but far too afraid to tell anybody for fear that we would be called fools. I've been a park ranger based in Indiana for quite some time now. The days have become slow and the nights even slower. We have a beautiful countryside here, but it's a shame that the people from the neighboring towns don't appreciate what they got right here on their doorstep. I've been doing this job for a long time, since the very birth of my son. It's amazing. But during the spring of 2001, something happened on one of my late nights. We had been having a problem with one of our vegetable gardens and the town being vandalized at night by what we suspected were troubled teenagers. Every night, one of us would sit up, update our databases, and keep watch of the gardens. It had been about six weeks since anything noteworthy happened, and I was beginning to think that these teenagers had lost interest in the gardens. But I continued to look out with my binoculars, should I hear anything. This particular night, it would have been right around May in 2001, and my wife and I had just had our daughter. So, I was tired. I mean dead tired. We bottle fed the little one, so I had to get up often during the nights. My entire routine was whacked, and I was continually exhausted at work. You know how it is when you get one bad sleep, and it just dominoes, and then you get another bad night of sleep. Eventually, after a few nights, your body is just so worn down from not getting the required sleep it needs. And because of this, I nodded off as I was supposed to be planning a guided tour. But I awoke when I heard a strange sound coming down from the area where the gardens are at. I went down to investigate what it was, light in hand. It was all so confusing. This didn't sound like people. Usually, they would be screaming and shouting but this was like a wailing sound. I could have swore it was the sound of a crying baby or even a crying woman. I'm not gonna lie, it was incredibly creepy. I didn't know what it was, but it was my job to go on to investigate. I set it with my light and my hat. If some young punks were messing around, I would make them sorry. I didn't feel like an incredibly tough guy, but I knew that I was the wrong guy to mess with. As I set out, I couldn't see a thing. Everything was dark. In fact, even the entire area was submerged in a thick darkness. Was this a prank? I could still hear the wailing sound and stood still to try and figure out where exactly it was coming from. It seemed to be coming from over in an area on the far end. I walked over there carefully, the wailing sound mingling with the sound of my light and my boots. I realized how totally unarmed I was. If this was any kind of animal or beast, I was a goner. I only had my two fists to fend off my attacker, and I'm pretty sure any animal would make quick use of that. Plus, on top of that, I was utterly exhausted and not in my peak physical form. What was I going to do, I thought as I stood there. I thought I was going to have to tell some teenagers off, thinking I was all big and bad. But now things have evolved. 
I continued watching in the direction of where the guard was. Then, walked over carefully, trying to be as quiet as possible. It was very possible that this was just a fox that had given birth, and that was the wailing sound that I was hearing. But I spotted something green on the ground. It was seafoam green and real bright. I wondered what it was. I squinted, continued watching it. This thing appeared to have wings and were batting back and forth as if it was trying to fly. I watched in disturbing horror and amazement. It was a tiny flying lizard-like creature. There was no doubt in my mind. It had a long green tail and it was no more the size of a very small dog. A fairy, perhaps. What exactly was this thing? It had all the features you would expect. My heart was racing. I walked closer and knelt down in the front of it. It seemed to not even notice my presence, even though it was right there in front of me and I was looking at it. This was a small flying lizard-like creature. I gasped in amazement, but then something miraculous happened. The entire area went from pitch dark, an all-consuming darkness, to an all-consuming, intense white light. It then faded, and this creature that was in front of me was now gone. Had I just seen an illusion? What on earth was going on? I felt an overwhelming safety come over me, that this thing, whatever it was, was gone. Even though it intended no harm, or showed any form of hostility towards me. The overwhelming sense of peace and calmness laid on me thick. The entire experience was extremely weird. I looked around to see if anybody was there, but I couldn't see a thing. Everything, even the light level, returned to normal. So, I walked back to my station and packed my things and went home. Although I did return to work, I didn't say anything. I didn't want everybody to think I was crazy or had some sort of psychotic episode or breakdown. I didn't even tell my wife as I did have a history of depression and I was afraid she would have me committed. But I know what I saw was real and completely unexplainable. The only thing that was more strange was the all-consuming darkness in which what I would call this fairy recited in, and then for me to spot it, and then for an overwhelming white light to envelop both of us and it to be gone. Maybe, just maybe, forest fairies are real, and they really do happen in certain places and certain times. I have no doubt that what I saw was not an hallucination, but reality. Earlier this year, during quarantine, the start of quarantine, I encountered something in the deep woods of Texas as I took a few students out for a worm survey. You don't expect to encounter anything terrible during such an academic outing, but we did. I am a lecturer at Texas State University, and for that reason, I'll refrain on giving you my identity. I have worked in the field of environmental science for well over 20 years. I do my job with pride and enjoy passing that passion onto my students. A field trip involving me and three of my top students ended in a great deal of distress and fear for us all. I took three students into the deep woods for a worm observation survey. There was concerns of several species becoming depleted or extinct. And so, we were doing an observation survey and then entering our findings into a database used by all academics over the US. It was early in the morning when we set forth, right around 7 a.m. The sun was coming up and there was a beautiful freshness and ripeness in the forced air. My three students 
consist of one male and two female, all in their mid-twenties, on top with all kinds of technology that I wasn't. We would be camping out for two nights, so we decided to pitch our tents. It was also chilly weather, so myself and one of my students, we'll call her Adrian, went to go get some firewood to start a fire and to keep food cooked and keep us warm. As we set off, we entered a very densely forested part of the woods. When I say thickly forested, I mean it. It suddenly got very dark around us, and I had the sense we were disturbing something. In my years in the academics, I have encountered all kinds of strange creatures. I normally get a certain degree of excitement and then curiosity as I look them up later on in our database and enter my sighting. As we searched around the ground for our wood and put them in a makeshift wheelbarrow, I heard Adrian scream. I knew it must have been something bad. Adrian was wanting to go and specialize in insects, and she would have not have screamed for anything little. So, I looked over at her, and I could see her standing, staring at something behind the trees. She was solid, frozen to the ground, like a statue, and her hands were covering her mouth in clear shock. I walked over, threading carefully, expecting to see a bear or any other kind of dangerous animal that might pose as a threat. I can't even begin to describe to you the horror I felt in my stomach when I spotted this unknown creature. This thing was unlike anything I had ever seen. It was about the same size as a large dog or wolf, except it was covered in white, scaly, sticky looking skin. It stood on four legs, just like a typical canid. Its face was deformed and had a very lifeless look to it, with pieces of its flesh missing, looking like it was partially rotted. Its face reminded me of a severe case of necrosis. We both sat there, staring in horror at this thing as it was sniffing around. We both looked at each other and we both knew we had never seen anything like this before in our lives. This was a miracle, or rather a tragedy. Clearly, something had gone wrong in Mother Nature to birth such a terrible creature. For what felt like 10 minutes, we stood there, staring at this thing. I felt sick to my stomach. After an incredibly long stare down, this thing eventually seemed to lose interest and retreated deeper into the woods. Myself and Adrian got back to camp and we told the others what had happened. At first, they thought we were joking, but when we really sat down and told them everything, they believed the sternness and serious on our faces. Adrian left that day. She no longer felt safe. Apart from me, I didn't exactly blame her. I believe we spotted something monstrous something demonic, which is hard for me to say in my line of work, but I can tell you that it was unnatural. As we sat there in camp that night, I kept looking side to side, expecting to see the beast stalking. I was debating on what to do and if I should go home. Eventually, when I did get home, I had a chance to recollect my thoughts and really take it all in. That image of the beast is forever burned in my mind. I mean, I had plenty of time to look at it, because we had quite the stare down. Maybe one day, this thing will show itself again. But I have the feeling that we disturbed it, and it probably rarely comes out. I just want anyone who goes into the deep woods to be very cautious and careful about anything strange or unknown to man. Things like that do exist, and we can't be in denial about things that we don't know about. This is just a quick thing, but something that has bothered me for years. 
mainly because I have never been able to find a rational explanation for what it is that I saw. With lots of stories about encounters, the person who sees the weird thing is usually alone, which then leads to the issue of validity, as nobody else can verify what was supposedly seen unless they were together with friends or family. But even then, anybody like yourself hardly hears from the additional friend or family member. Well, my story is a little different. Although to this day, I still have no definitive answer. And there were four of us when it happened. It was a summer's evening. So although it was getting late, there was still some light in the sky, meaning we could take the shortcut through the woods back home from high school, as it wasn't pitch black in there. Not that we were scared. It was more in case of not wanting to trip over brambles or step into anything. We just watched our team beat the rivals, and we were all pumped full of adrenaline and excess excitement and energy that only teenagers seem to have. There was me, and my best friend, and our girlfriends. We were juniors, and what I would call generally good kids. I mean, we all hung out with decent crowds. Never did anything too bad. We all wanted to go to college after graduation. So, although we weren't total dorks, we did behave well. That was one of the reasons our parents and the police believed our story. At first, at the very least. On that same summer's evening, right at the start of our year of high school, we came upon something in the woods that we will never forget. We were laughing and joking, pushing each other around a little, and just when Jason, my buddy, suddenly called out, What the hell? I'd given him a playful shove, and he'd even tumbled backwards just a little tripping over his own feet. This usually would have led to laughter all around, including Jason. So I was a little surprised that he sounded pissed. What's up? He told me not you. I joked, reaching my hand down to grab him. And that's when I saw it. There was blood and guts all over the ground. With Jason sitting right in it. Alice, his girlfriend, screaming. He jumped up real fast, checking his body to make sure it wasn't from him. Feeling totally grossed out, but also kind of curious, I poked my head around the trees that were tunneling the path we were on. My God, how I wish I hadn't. Strung up in the trees were bodies. Thankfully, I guess. They look to probably be deer. Definitely animal and not human in any way, which was really the only saving grace. My girlfriend Tammy took one look and just puked all down me. We had the good sense to get out of there as fast as we could. The girls being in hysterics and me and Jason not far behind. We went straight to his house after his mom had stopped freaking out and checking him to make sure he wasn't the one losing blood. She called the police. They were straight down there. But you know what the weirdest thing was? They didn't find anything. They even went back with him the next day and showed them the exact spot. But there was nothing. So, they took Jason's clothes and even ran tests but apparently there was nothing conclusive. We all know what we saw, even the deer carcasses. Jason was covered in blood. How it all just disappeared without a trace, well, we will never know. In order to tell this story, I first have to explain the geography of my parents' property. The land our house sits on is surrounded on all sides by a steep ravine. Viewed from above, it looks like an island of land. The only way across this ring of sunken land 
this mode of woods and scrub is a rickety bridge that my father built when he was a young man. Don't tell him I said this, but that was a long time ago. One of my earliest childhood memories is being sternly charged to not go down into the ravine under any circumstances. If I saw somebody down there that needed help, I was to call my parents or the police. If one of my toys happened to fall down there, I was to alert my parents and they would retrieve it. I always wondered why it was so dangerous for me, but safe for them. But I knew better than to say anything out loud. Then the day came, as it always does, when I was tempted to go down into the ravine myself. It wasn't for the reasons you'd suspect. I did not lose a toy. I didn't see anybody injured. I saw something that I simply couldn't explain, and I wanted a closer look. At first, I thought it had been some kind of wolf. It appeared to be injured because it shuffled along, although it was moving fairly quickly. It was when it looked up at me, and I could see that it wasn't a wolf at all, but a little girl, possibly about my age at the time, maybe seven or eight if I had to guess. She was crawling on all fours and moving way too fast for a child in that position. It was like I was watching a recording that was sped up. She darted here and darted there, among the thick undergrowth of the ravine, occasionally looking up at me to see what I was doing, if I was in fact still there. There was something unsettling about the whole thing. From the way she looked at me, to the speed at which she moved. Her clothing, some sort of nighty, was soiled to the point that it was the color of mud. It might have been white or some other light color, but there was no way of knowing then. It was in one of those moments that we were staring at each other that I decided to toss her a ball. I picked the one I didn't really like. It was pink and hard. I had found it on a walk, so it wasn't really mine. I winced when it bounced off her head, but she didn't even recognize that it had hit her. She still stood there and stared. After too long, she picked up the ball and very awkwardly, but deftly threw it back to me. I caught it. She would show up for days in a row, but only when I was by myself. It was after several weeks of this that I decided that she posed no real threat to me, no matter how strange or different she may be. So the next time I saw her, I clambered down the treacherous slope of the ravine, down to meet her. She waited until the second that I was on level ground with her. Then she scooted off in that strange, hyperactive four-legged crawl. I followed and she kept looking behind me to make sure that I was still following her. Of course I was. I was getting scratched up really bad by thorns and bramble and other stinging plants, but I was far too enamored with my new friend to get a clue. She led me to a very small space of the forest floor. This is the same space where dead leaves pulled around what looked to be an abandoned stone well. I thought the bridge my dad had built looked old. This thing was even older. My new friend clambered into it head first. I swallowed a lump in my throat, waiting. Well, she never came back out. She didn't even peek over the top to see what I was doing. Closing the distance between me and that well had to have been one of the hardest things I've ever done my heartbeat getting louder with each step. I wanted to run, but I also had to see what she was doing in there. This strange new friend that apparently lived in a hole in the ground. The well was filled clear to the top with bodies. Some of them were just bones. Others were recent. All of them were children. 
My new friend was the freshest, and her mouth was frozen in a silent scream aimed skyward. Flies darting in and out of her mouth. Maggots abundant. I couldn't hear her, so I screamed. I ran back all the way up to her yard. I reached the phone and called the cops. My parents were arrested and sentenced for the kidnapping and deaths of over 30 children since the 80s. I was then put into the foster home. Look, you don't have to believe my story, but it gives me such a cynical little laugh looking back. I thought my new friend was some kind of monster. My parents were the monsters. I don't know why they loved me, but murdered so many. It was determined that I was indeed their biological child. Probably the only reason I didn't end up in that same well. My family lived out in the countryside of Alabama. Me, my parents, and my three siblings. I was the youngest. There was just enough true wilderness around our four acres that we were forbidden from going into the woods at night. No problem. I didn't want to go into the woods at night. Sure, my brothers were stupid enough to want to go out and get lost in the dark with the bugs and the wolves. But I was fine to be where the air conditioning and the TV and our dogs were located. It was my father that on occasion scheduled little outings before bed, looking at the night sky with whoever was willing. My brothers could not get enough. Me, I begged to be left out of the whole thing. But dad especially wanted me to see the constellations and the nighttime phenomena. I just thought he was picking on me, since I was the most reluctant. One night, he woke me up and asked me to get dressed. He told me that he had something special for me. I was gonna have to go outside to get it. It was close to my birthday, and I thought maybe I was getting an early present. It was kind of chilly, so I bundled up and followed him outside, all sleepy, but excited nonetheless. It was a full moon, and the night world was lit up to an unusual degree of visibility. It was actually a wonderful sight. I was happy to see this. My enthusiasm started to flag when I could see that I was being led to the tree line. I started to think I saw other people among the trees. There actually were others, but they were naked. A strange sort of apprehension came over me, torn between wanting to see what my dad was going to give me and alarm over the fact that we were going to meet up with naked people. We got close enough for me to notice that they weren't really people. Their heads were too large, their eyes too big. They didn't have noses just nostrils. They swayed side to side in unison, though they didn't all stand together. I knew just about enough of popular depictions of space aliens to become afraid, but I didn't get a chance to do anything about it. My father touched me with a finger that was way too long to be one of his own, and from that point on, my mind went blank. I woke up in my bed in my pajamas. My father lumbered around the house in a sleepy daze like last night had never happened. I asked him what last night was all about and how he had come in the company of space aliens. The confusion on his face was indeed genuine. He told me that I would have to turn that nightmare into a movie or a book someday. And I almost bought into the idea that it had all been just a vivid, wild dream. In fact, my auntie Vivian passed away just a few weeks later. She had been dear to all of us, so we made arrangements to travel out of state to her funeral. I can remember standing next to the casket in the line of people filing past it, when I felt a sort of buzzing sensation in my forehead. 
what happened next defies true description. I began downloading all of my aunt's memories. They flashed through my head at overwhelming speeds as a jumbled mess of images. But when it was over, I could have told you her entire life story from birth onward. To this day, when I stand near the deceased, I download their memories. My theory is that the aliens, or whatever they were, interdimensional beings, gave me the ability to copy the pattern of the neurons in a person's brain into my own memories, the part of my brain that makes me who I am. But I can't be sure. Needless to say, I do work in forensics. I have no idea if this is what the aliens wanted me to do or not. They gave me this gift. No, I'm not this forthright about my gift with people in person. Are you kidding me? They'd have me committed. And I know this sounds like some sort of crazy episode of some sort of science fiction show, but I'm just telling you what I've experienced and the phenomena that surrounds my current situation. I was tromping around, deep in the swamps of the bayous with my sister. We were old enough to do whatever we wanted, though our parents didn't quite agree. We just weren't the kind that could be held down. We got out of the boat when everybody was gone, and we plunged into that wonderland of trees, standing up out of the water like the roots were stilts, and hanging moss and vine and giant bugs. We were so crazy. We loved it. We came across these mounds of plant matter that we couldn't exactly identify. They stood anywhere from five to seven feet tall and almost looked like they were covered in a weird fungus. But there were also other fruiting bodies of fungi on them that seemed to glow a little bit in the shade. They were clustered together in an area of the swamp that I can really only describe as the heart of the wetland. We were probably as far into the swamp as we could go before we could say we were going out of the swamp. You get me? The birds that were fitting from one mound to another suddenly abandoned them. The things were beginning to move. First, they swayed a bit. Then, one of them moved just a few inches. Then, they started making this strange gurgling sound. Before we knew it, they were full-blown following us. I hadn't realized how many of them there were until they were closing in on us from all directions. All we had to move were the oars. Moving was a real problem since we were using the oars to defend ourselves as much as we were using them to escape. When they got so close, they began lashing out at us with these vine-like things that were kind of slimy and sticky. Both of us were lifted out of the boat and I was pulled inside one of these mounds. The last thing I saw was the same thing happening to my sister. I don't really know how to explain what happened to me inside the mound. I thought I was a goner. The thing formed sinuses in itself so I could breathe. Then I started smelling something awfully sweet. It made me drowsy and I drifted off before I could get any notion of fighting off this thing. I woke up at the edge of the swamp. The boat was with me. My sister wasn't. Ma and Pa were livid. Of course they wouldn't buy my story, no matter how many times I told them. We was having dinner one night when I started coughing really bad, and I nearly died, horking up a few small things that looked like miniature versions of those mounds. They landed in my meatloaf, sawed most of it away with their little tentacles, and crawled off. My parents were a little closer to thinking that my tall tail wasn't exactly so tall. I took it upon myself to backtrack my way to where those things took my sister. I did eventually find my sister, 
lying in the middle of an open clearing, totally unharmed and completely out of it as if she had no idea where she was or what had happened. I found her, told her what had happened to me, and she seemed to have zero recollection of anything that had occurred the day prior. So, I know my encounter is very weird and seems like it would be out of some sort of show, but there are things that twist and play with our mind, and I feel like something alien, something foreign had to be doing this, creating illusions or hallucinations. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe, next time, we should just stay out of the swamp. I do say that most of the cryptid encounters that I have ever heard about seem to involve the woods, or driving, or being at least somewhere pretty far away from your own house. And I guess that is because most of these creatures live in places like the woods and hidden in caves to keep away from people. That is why they are such a mystery. My story is a bit different, because when I saw a cryptid, and I have no idea what exactly it was. It stood outside my very front door. Backtracking just a little, I live in a pretty rural area where you have to drive to your neighbor. It's not like I'm in an apartment block in New York or anything. We're surrounded by agriculture and farmland, so pretty huge fields and lots of lots of trees. Plenty of places for something like my visitor to love without ever being seen. The kids had stayed really late in school for various practice, and my husband had driven into town to pick them up. He was going to take them out. So, I had the place to myself for a bit. At the time, I was in the kitchen making lunch when I heard a sound outside. It sounded like a banging up against the front house. I thought that was unusual. It was dark, and too dark for anybody to be out there, at least unnoticed. My dog began growling, not barking, just growling, which is odd, because usually, whenever there is somebody, he goes nuts. I yelled that I'm coming, assuming that it was somebody out front, not really sure or adding up in my mind that everything was too off. I did have a good sense to check the people before I opened the door, just to make sure there wasn't a masked gunman or anything. But when I looked out, no one, nada, nothing. There was nobody there. Now that was odd. The dog who would usually be at my feet trying to sick whoever was there was still in the kitchen, growling and whining, alternating between the two. Against my better judgment and my gut instinct, I opened the door. The porch light was on, but apart from that, it was practically pitch black. I don't know why, but instead of just closing the door and walking away, back to the safety of the kitchen, I heard myself calling out. There was rustling, and then this creature appeared. I don't think I was frightened immediately, more shocked, and also a notion of disbelief. The thing coming toward me was in no way human. My mind made that out pretty quickly, but it wasn't like any animal I have ever seen. It was grayish in color, and appeared to be covered in some thick, strange hair. It walked on two legs like a man, but its feet were cloven. It also had long, thin arms hanging by its side, longer than human arms would reach. Again, it had very bizarre-shaped hands. The face was even like a person, except it wasn't. The best way I can describe was kind of it like being Voldemort, you know, from Harry Potter. That sort of pseudo-human feature. Weird enough. It also had tiny wings that appeared to be on it. They were kind of scaly and tattered like a bat's. I stood there for a moment, almost expecting somebody to jump out with a video camera and shout, you're pranked, or surprise. 
the dog started freaking out the second this thing came into view. Suddenly remembering like it was meant to protect me and began barking like mad. My visitor took one look and fled. It ran off. I'm not sure where it went. I'm not sure how long the dog kept barking. I stood there on the doorstep, terrified, mouth agape, wondering what just happened. What did I see? Trying to process what I just encountered. I don't know what that thing wanted or why it chose to knock on the door. It sure looked strong enough to have ripped the door open had it wanted to harm me. When I had looked at it, despite it being some sort of abomination, it did not appear threatening, although it did come and try to approach me. Again, if it had wanted to, I'm pretty sure it could have just eaten me or my dog. But it didn't give off a harmful aura. Of course, when my husband and kids came home, I told them. They're in high school. I wouldn't tell a kindergartner this stuff. They all thought I'd been drinking too much wine. Once I'd managed to finally convince them, they all went outside with lights and a gun, my husband insisting on taking the shotgun. But of course, there were no signs or evidence. Oh, and for the record, I live out in rural Ohio, so I don't think this could have been a house call from the Jersey Devil. I'm hoping one of your listeners might have a suggestion, or you. By the way, I love your show a lot. I listen to it almost nightly, and I thought what a better way to contribute to your show than to tell you my own story. Thanks for reading. I run a pet walking service, and most of the time, especially when I have more than just a couple, I take them to the doggy park, or just somewhere where I can easily keep them on the leash and I remain in control. But sometimes, if I have just one, I take them to these woods that is just a short drive from my town. There, they can roam around and sniff as many trees as they like, and most times, we don't usually see anybody else. Usually, I would only take a dog that I had previous experience with so I knew what their behavior is like and whether they might try to run off and jump straight into dirty, stagnant water. But, I let my buddy convince me that his mother's dog was as good as gold and so off I went. Almost to the woods, I let her off the leash and she ran straight past the trees and towards the water. I'm a pretty good dog walker, not a good dog groomer. However, it is an unwritten rule that you don't return a dog covered in crap from a stagnant pond. I started calling her, but I could just hear her happy noises and splashing. So I made my way to the trees, knowing I'd now be transporting a stinky dog. The splashing noises were replaced with whining. I raced behind the tree line to the stink water and saw her still in it, but frozen and staring, quivering at the trees behind the water. And then I saw why. Something was watching from just behind the trees. I could just about make out the shape of it in the shadows. It was fairly short, but bigger than any animal I could think of that would usually be roaming around. I'm guessing five feet. It also stood up on two legs, like a humanoid, a bipedal humanoid, which was scary. It was dark in color, but I couldn't tell if it had fur or just darker skin. The body seemed short, so it was mainly all legs, and then this large head, which kind of looked like it had antlers but there was in no way any kind of deer. Its eyes were a shining yellow light. It was hard to tell whether it had arms, but if so, they must have been pointed to the front, like if a rabbit stands up, as I can't see them by its side like a person. The dog was still staring at it. Then, this thing, an alien, whatever you call it, made an awful noise, like a shriek. 
It actually hurt my ears, it was so high-pitched. Then, it turned and went back into the trees. That seemed to release the dog from whatever trance she was in, as she came racing back over. I put the leash on, and we got the hell out of there. Never have I returned there by myself or with dogs. I don't know what freaking alien I saw that day. One night, I was out with some buddies, and we were just driving around. When you live in a small town, there isn't much to do other than hang out with each other, visit coffee shops, and goof off. It was too cold to just hang out in one of the parking lots, or even outside 7-Eleven. So we hopped in the car, cranked on some music, and off we went. We just liked driving around. We didn't have much of a plan where to actually go. And of course, before long, we needed gas. There had been this rumor going around about a road towards the edge of town where sometimes, supposedly, if you caught it just right, you could see the hollow man. Apparently, he'd been dubbed that as he was real tall, but super skinny too, like as if he was hollow on the inside. Then, there was all sorts of BS floating about, with rules as to when and how you could see him. Like it had to be a full moon, or you had to be a virgin, or, according to one of the football players, you had to like partying and hooking up. But I think that was only him. We were pretty close to the road now, so it seemed like the perfect idea to go and park. We'd still get to hang out. We'd been saving gas, and we might have seen a chance on seeing this thing. There were four of us in the car at the time, all us guys, and none of us remotely believed for one moment that there really was somebody who appeared in the road. After all, I was convinced it was total BS, and no doubt actually made up by one of the jocks probably to impress girls. So, we sat there, Listening to some metal. My phone was still playing some classic Guns N' Roses as we all just sat there. No one daring for a minute or two to move or say anything. He'd come out of nowhere. But now, there, he was catching the full beam of headlights. He was indeed really tall, if I had to guess. He was also not just skinny, but skeletal in nature like he was literally just made of bones with skin stretched over it. His arm and legs were like sticks, nearly bones, and he was very pale and gray and nearly white. His head was tiny, large empty eyes, and a small tiny mouth. I was in the back seat as my buddy was driving. He suddenly tried to whip his phone and snap a picture. Whether it was the sudden movement or the flash, I don't know. But he, or it, whatever it was, ran back into the trees from where he must have come from. We all just sat there, and Ryan did happen to snap a photo. But of course, due to the motion and the lighting, it was blurry. So, we all knew what we saw as the hollow man. Well, after doing a little bit of research on Google, turns out that the descriptions of what we saw actually point us to the crawler, meaning that this thing was either the rake or a crawler, which I guess have been reported all throughout America. Pretty eerie to know that we've saw something that many don't believe exist, while many others report seeing in their home states too. That's my encounter story.